Here's a question for you. How many people does it take to turn on a light bulb? The answer seems simple. Just walk into a dark room, flip a switch, and instantly you can see, right? Well, the truth is there's a lot more to generating and delivering electrical power than you've probably imagined. Hi, I'm Lee Patrick Sullivan with Energy Now, and this Energy 101 video explains the system used to generate electricity. And it also explains what it really takes to turn on a light bulb. In order to understand energy, we first need to start at the source, literally. Mother Nature provides the natural resource we use to generate power. From natural gas to coal, ocean tides to mountain winds, the energy we need to create electricity must first be mined, harnessed, or collected from the earth. Some of these resources are finite, including fossil fuels like coal and oil, but others are unlimited, like solar or wind power. But a lump of coal or a strong breeze alone won't create the power that turns on your light. For every energy source, a chemical or mechanical process is required to turn it into usable electricity. Every day, researchers work to find innovative ways to use our limited resources, process raw materials, harness renewables more efficiently, and find entirely new energy sources. Today, the majority of America's electricity comes from thermal power plants. Fuels like coal, natural gas, biomass, and uranium are used to heat water until it produces steam, which powers a turbine and generates electricity. That steam turns propeller-like blades around a rotor inside the turbine. This turning rotor connects to a main shaft, which spins magnets with a coil inside a generator. It's the generator inside a turbine that converts mechanical energy into electric energy and creates electricity. Steam is an efficient method of producing electricity because the water can be recycled and reused as it changes back and forth between liquid and gaseous states. Transporting electricity from the power plant to your home is an entirely different process. Current technology cannot cost-effectively store large amounts of electricity, so significant challenges exist when it comes to transferring that electricity across long distances. Just enough electricity has to be generated to meet demand at all times and be transmitted through power lines to reach your light switch. Too much or too little power can crash the transmission system and cause a blackout. That's why a complex mix of logistics, management, and infrastructure is needed to transmit electricity from power generators to consumers. Enter the electricity grid, also known as simply the grid. The North American electricity grid is actually made of four large grid systems. The Western grid, the Eastern grid, the Texas grid, and a grid covering the Canadian province of Quebec. These independent regional networks of power plants and transmission lines carry electric energy at high voltage within their area to local utilities. There are very limited links between the four grids, which means electricity generated from a wind turbine in West Texas cannot reach an apartment building in New York City. For electricity to move through one of the four grids, its voltage must first be increased by a device called a transformer. Then the electricity can travel long distances across high voltage transmission lines. These high voltage lines are generally strung between giant metal towers. They stretch for miles from power plants to local substations in each neighborhood. You've probably seen substations along the side of the road and wonder what they do. Well, their job is stepping down electric voltages from levels as high as 765,000 volts closer to the 110 volts you use in your home. The electricity from the power line on your street passes through another transformer, which steps down the voltage once more, and then it travels along the line into your house. From there, the electricity enters your breaker box and it is then distributed to light sockets and outlets. All you have to do is flip a switch. So, as you can see, 
from the raw materials to the power lines on your street, there's so much more to the electricity ecosystem than meets the eye. One, two, three, it's all about electricity because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Circuits closed, voltage there. Current flows, power everywhere. Use AC. Although power plants may appear complex, the basic processes used to create electricity are surprisingly simple. Let's take a look at how it works. Most power plants generate heat in order to produce steam, which drives turbines that generate electricity. Nuclear fission, natural gas, and coal are the main fuels used in the United States. At Fisk & Crawford, coal is the fuel burned to generate heat. Traditional coal-fired power plants like Fisk & Crawford have two basic components. The first is a furnace boiler designed to burn coal and capture the resulting heat energy using a system of circulating water and steam. The process starts with the boiler, which is a furnace where combustion takes place. Pulverized coal is injected with a stream of air into the furnace in a continuous process through a device known as a burner. Burners ignite the coal and air mixture, creating a maximum amount of heat possible, as much as 1500 degrees centigrade. The second part of the system is a steam turbine generator, which converts the heat energy captured by the steam into electrical energy. First, the intense boiler heat coming from the furnace turns water running through the pipes around the boiler into steam. The steam travels through more pipes to the turbine, causing it to spin and turn the shaft of the generator, which creates electricity. Another series of pipes allows the steam to cool, condensing back into water heading back to the boiler where the process begins again. About electricity because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Every hour the sun's energy falls on the planet is equal to the amount of energy used by the entire human population in one year. The energy from the sun is in limitless supply. Unlike oil or gas, solar power is a reliable source of energy whose prices never fluctuate. Solar energy is free. How does it work? Solar electricity is generated using photovoltaic cell technology that has been optimized over years of research. Simply put, the greater the intensity of the sun, the greater the current of electricity. Solar panels collect sunlight and turn it into direct current or DC electricity. Even on cloudy days, your panels will absorb sunlight. The system's inverter then turns this DC electricity into the same electric current that comes from your traditional utility lines. Your solar electric system is connected directly to your utility power supply so that the excess power from your solar panels will be fed back to your local utility company. One, two, three, song about electricity because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Hi, I'm Lacey Lett, and today I'd like to talk to you about natural gas power plants. Many Americans use natural gas for heating their homes and cooking their food. But did you know that gas also produces about 30% of our electricity? And that percentage is expected to grow because natural gas has become the number one choice for large new power plants in the United States. So how do these natural gas plants work? Well, they work much like the spinning turbine of a powerful jet engine. Burning natural gas at the power plant heats up the air needed to spin the hundreds of propeller-like blades in the turbine. The turbine is connected by a shaft to a generator that makes an electric current. By spinning magnets through a wire coil, it converts the mechanical energy of the turbine 
into electricity. That's why it's called a generator. This type of power plant is called a simple cycle gas turbine because, well, it's pretty simple. There's only one turbine and one generator. There's also a second type of natural gas plant called a combined cycle power plant. It combines a gas turbine and a steam turbine used in a coal power plant. But instead of using coal or even more gas to create steam, a combined cycle plant uses the exhaust heat from the gas turbine to boil water into steam. The steam then drives a second turbine, which spins a second generator, producing even more electricity. This two-step combined cycle process is highly efficient, converting as much as 50% of the energy contained in natural gas into electricity. In comparison, coal-fired steam turbines are only about 33% efficient. And this is one of the main reasons why gas-fired power plants are better for the environment. Natural gas starts out with a lower carbon content than coal, and with more efficient power plants, it can produce electricity with about 60% less carbon dioxide than coal-fired power plants. Also, natural gas plants do not release many of the toxic substances like mercury that comes from burning coal. Modern natural gas plants can get going in just 15 minutes. That makes them ideal for backing up renewables since they can switch on and off faster than most other conventional plants and partner with wind and solar energy as the wind changes or clouds move across the sky. Besides helping the environment, natural gas plants also make financial sense. According to the United States Energy Information Administration, when you consider the construction and fuel costs, natural gas plants are the cheapest kind of new power generation you can build right now. So from efficiency to affordability to helping the environment, it's easy to see why natural gas is playing a bigger role in supplying our electricity One, two, three, needs. Song of electricity because the powers our lives makes it possible for us to thrive. Because the powers our lives makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Circuits closed. Voltage there. Half of the world's electricity is generated by coal power plants, and there are close to 3,000 large coal power plants around the world. In this video, we're going to show you how these controversial, yet indispensable power plants work. The, the idea behind the power plant in this video is to show you how to convert energy stored in the coal to electricity. To increase burning efficiency, a powdered coal and air mixture enters the furnace. During the burning process, the chemical energy stored in the coal is released as heat to create high temperatures inside the furnace. This heat passes to the water inside the coils located in the furnace. The hot water is then forced to move to the boiler where it evaporates and generates high pressure steam. The high pressure steam is taken to the steam turbine and the energy inside the steam is converted to mechanical energy. This mechanical en energy is then transferred to the generator where it will be converted to electricity. The generated electricity is finally transferred to the grid through a transformer and is ready to be consumed by the public. There are two major water cycles in any power plant whether it is a coal, nuclear, or a gas power plant. The first is the closed loop power producing water cycle, which we call the steam cycle. The second is the open loop cooling water cycle. No thermal power plant can operate without these two cycles. Let's begin by describing the closed loop power cycle, or the steam cycle, starting from the furnace. First. Intense heat inside the furnace heats the water within the coils, which is coming from the condenser. This heated water is forced to the boiler where it evaporates. The, 
pressure inside the boiler can be more than 200 bars. The high pressure steam obtained in the boiler is sent to the steam turbine, which passes the steam between fixed and rotating sections, converting the energy stored in the steam to mechanical energy. The steam leaves the turbine at close to vacuum pressure, near condensation temperature. This saturated dry steam then enters the condenser where it is condensed to water by the cold water coming from the river. Finally, the condensed water is pumped to the furnace where it starts heating the coils inside the furnace to complete its cycle. Here's a question for you to think about that we'll answer in our next video. Why is a very small portion of pressurized steam diverted to the bearing section of the turbine where the low pressure steam leaves the turbine? Now let's discuss the second cycle, the open loop cooling cycle, which starts by pumping cold water from the up upstream section of the river into the condenser inside the steel tubes. While saturated steam is condensed to water, the water from the river is heated. The heated water is then dispensed to the downstream section of the river. To protect ecological stability of the river, the temperature rise should be kept to a minimum. In short, dispelled water makes the river or lake warmer than it otherwise would be. This is why some marine animals, such as manatees, spend their winter close to the power plants protect themselves from the harsh winter temperatures. One, two, three, song about electricity because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Circuits close, voltage there. Nuclear energy facilities generate carbon-free electricity in 30 countries around the world. Nuclear energy production is similar to the ways fossil-fueled power plants generate electricity. A nuclear energy facility provides clean, safe electricity 24 hours a day. Let's go inside the plant to find out how. In most generating plants, whether coal, nuclear, or natural gas, some form of energy is used to heat water into steam. This steam turns a turbine that is coupled to an electromagnet called a generator. The generator produces electricity. While the model is the same, there is a key difference between nuclear energy facilities and other electricity generating plants. Power plants that run on fossil fuels burn coal, oil, or natural gas to generate the heat that creates steam. In a nuclear energy facility, a chain reaction of splitting atoms releases heat. This reaction takes place in the reactor. All reactors are designed, built, and operated with safety as a top priority. Nuclear energy facilities are among the safest facilities in the world because they feature multiple redundant layers of safety systems and procedures, beginning in the core of the reactor. In a nuclear reactor, Metal rods with enriched uranium pellets inside are placed into bundles, creating a fuel assembly. The bundles are submerged in water inside a pressurized vessel. The two most common types of nuclear reactors are boiling water reactors and pressurized water reactors. In a boiling water reactor, the heat from split atoms causes the water to boil, producing steam that drives a turbine. Afterwards, the steam is converted back to liquid water and returned to the reactor core. Pressurized water reactors, or PWRs, were developed after boiling water reactors and work in a slightly different manner. In a PWR, the water in the reactor tank is under pressure to keep it from boiling even though it reaches very high temperatures. In the steam generator of a PWR, water passes through thousands of small pipes. The heat in the pipes turns the water to steam, which then drives the turbine. The turbine powers the generator, which in turn produces electricity. 
Here is where the process differs from a boiling water reactor. The reactor water is now pumped back into the reactor tank and heated again. The steam from the turbine is cooled in a condenser, and the resulting water is sent back into the steam generator and heated again. To prevent overheating, control rods made of a material that absorbs small atomic particles are inserted into the nuclear fuel bundle. When an operator wants to produce more heat, the control rods are raised out of the bundle. To create less heat, they are lowered into the bundle. The rods can also be lowered completely to shut the reactor down in the case of an accident or to refuel the facility. With this level of control, the operator of a nuclear energy facility is able to ensure that it continues to generate clean, safe and secure energy. Additional safety systems are in place that shut the reactor down quickly and stop the fission process, cool the reactor down and carry heat away from it, and create barriers to contain any radioactivity and prevent it from escaping into the environment. Nuclear energy facilities are the most efficient source of electricity in the world. One, two, three, song about electricity because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Circuits closed. The world needs transport fuels. Diesel is used in cars, trucks, heavy machinery, and ships. Diesel is even used to generate electricity in remote mining projects and domestic peak top-up power stations. Jet fuel is needed to power aircraft for commercial transport. Both diesel and jet fuel are used extensively by the defense services. Existing global fossil fuel oil reserves are rapidly depleting. At current rates of consumption, the world uses 30 billion barrels of oil per annum. Sourcing this oil poses security and environmental challenges. As reserves decrease and consumption increases, prices will continue to rise. The alternative viable way to source oil is from industrial scale, high yield growth systems using algae. Algae uses the sun, carbon dioxide, and nutrients to grow. In a controlled environment, algae can multiply many times each day. Selected algae can produce 50% oil and 50% biomass, which converts to fuel products. This makes algae one of the world's most valuable, sustainable, and renewable fuel resources. Algae Tech has perfected an industrial scale technology to grow algae for fuel. Algae Tech technology is based on the growing and harvesting of this valuable algae. The Makanchi Strout technology uses 40 foot shipping containers, along with a solar source of light, to grow algae rapidly and profitably in a scalable and environmentally sustainable enclosed system. The Algae Tech solution has been recognized internationally for low water use. The ability to capture waste carbon dioxide feeds from industry and power stations and the scalable modular design. A look inside the technology shows how light, carbon dioxide and nutrients deliver a powerful algae growth mix in the controlled enclosed photobioreactors. The resulting algae is made up of valuable oil, sugar and protein biomass. The algae is separated into oil and biomass. These products are refined to produce biodiesel, jet fuel, and ethanol. Importantly, algae tech fuel has major cost advantages. It can be produced at approximately half the price of the current crude oil price. Algae tech is in the business of delivering algae growth systems that offer cost competitive, secure, high quality fuels for transport and power. Electricity because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to drive. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Circuits closed, voltage there, current.
Hot fractured rock, or HFR, geothermal energy, is a renewable form of energy harnessed from the Earth itself. Hot granites buried deep below the Earth's surface contain a huge amount of energy, and the Cooper Basin contains the hottest granites on Earth at reasonable drilling depth. This is a known resource with an energy potential comparable with Australia's coal reserves. The Cooper Basin Hot Rock Resource is within reach of conventional oil drilling rigs and is known to cover 1,500 square kilometres at a depth of approximately 3.5 to 4 kilometres. Fractured granite found at this level is heated naturally by radiogenic decay from the elements within it. This heat is insulated by thousands of metres of sedimentary rocks and slowly builds up over millions of years. Injecting water under pressure into the granite, in the same way as the oil and gas industry, can widen the fractures. This hydraulic injection triggers tiny micro-seismic events that enhance the permeability of joints a significant distance away from the injection well, creating a geothermal reservoir. Low temperature water flows through the reservoir, increasing to approximately 280 degrees Celsius at 5,000 metres below the surface. Geodynamics uses a closed pipe circuit to bring the naturally hot pressurised fluid to the surface before running it through a heat exchanger that extracts the thermal energy. The cooled, pressurised fluid is injected back into the reservoir. The closed loop system means the pressurised fluid is never exposed to air or light and does not diminish at all during the process, meaning zero water loss from the system. The superheated steam from the heat exchanger is used to drive a binary steam turbine in an adjacent power plant, thereby producing emission-free baseload electricity for supply to the national grid. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Circuits closed, voltage there, current flows, power everywhere. Use AC in factories and holes because we can't control. Hydroelectric power plant. In a hydroelectric power plant, electricity is produced from water. A dam is built across a large river to hold back the river water and raise its level to form a reservoir. At the bottom of the dam, there is a flood gate. Water flows through the pin stock and rotates the turbine. The flowing water rotates the turbine which is placed at the end of the pin stock. The turbine in turn rotates the shaft that is connected to the coils of a generator. These coils are placed in between strong magnetic poles. The rotating shaft turns the coils. The change in magnetic field due to the movement of the coils results in electric current. Electricity because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. Because it powers our lives, makes it possible for us to thrive. A four, five, six volt up potential difference makes electrons go round if the circuit is completely sound. Circuits close, voltage there, current flows, power everywhere. Use AC. Today's largest wind turbines can supply enough electricity to power 5,000 households and have an average lifespan of 20 years. But how do they work? A wind turbine converts the wind's kinetic energy into electrical energy. It comprises the following elements. A tower, about 80 to 90 meters high, in order to harness stronger winds at a higher altitude, a nacelle, which turns to orient the machine in the optimal direction, 
it houses the main components of the wind turbine and a three-bladed rotor which can measure 100 meters or more in diameter such as the Halliad 150 with its 150 meter diameter rotor. When the wind blows, the blades spin the rotor which in turn rotates the shaft fitted to the nacelle. This drive shaft is connected to a generator. This rotational energy will enable the production of electricity. Subsequently, a transformer located inside the nacelle or tower raises the current voltage. This allows it to be transported more efficiently via the electrical grid power lines. In order to function, a wind turbine needs a minimum wind speed of 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. And for safety reasons, a wind turbine will automatically stop when the wind speed exceeds 90 kilometers per hour. The power provided by a wind turbine increases exponentially to wind speed. Winds of 30 kilometers per hour are eight times more productive than winds of 15 kilometers per hour. Hence the location of the wind turbine is key. To harness the wind in the best possible way, equipment is integrated into the nacelle to continually measure the wind speed and direction. This enables the wind turbine to be optimally oriented into the wind and to modify the rotor blade angle. There are two main categories of wind turbines, onshore and offshore. The installation of offshore wind turbines, usually installed some 10 kilometers or more off the coast at a seabed depth of 25 to 30 meters, is more costly. The foundation and tower must be able to withstand the force of the waves and connection to the electrical grid means laying underwater cables. On the other hand, more regular winds enable the generation of typically 6 megawatts of electricity compared to 2 to 3 megawatts for onshore wind turbines. Modern wind turbines operate with an efficiency in the range of 20 to 50 percent. This is an excellent level of efficiency since the fuel of a wind turbine is free one of the many advantages of wind energy. One, two, three, song about electricity Because it powers our lives Makes it possible for us to thrive Because it powers our lives Makes it possible for us to thrive A four, five, six volt up potential difference Makes electrons go round If the circuit is completely sound Circuits closed Voltage there Use AC in factories and home.